Well, hello everybody. Welcome back to the channel. And it's a beautiful Friday uh, morning for you guys, at least. It's currently um, uh, 11.15 for where I am at, but I still have a lot of strength within me to be able to read to you guys a, gr a good work from St. Irenaeus, a great literary work from St. Irenaeus called Against Heresies. And we've gone through the introductory and preface of uh, St. Irenaeus. And we heard, and then as we know, he is basically, as suggested in this book, he polemicizes against these heresies. Now, I would also like to thank Dr. Falk for answering my inquiry on asking what does he mean, what does it mean when uh, they say that the communication of Irenaeus is prolix. That means he's worthy to excess. And then he also elaborated on how, where in the first few chapters, he will be elaborating or telling us what these heresies are. And for the later parts, he's going to tell us, he's going to give us his arguments, he's going to give us his angles, yada, 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 all that stuff. And why he abhors these things. So without further ado, let's read from chapters one to two. So. Let's open chapter one first. first. So just let me know. put it in full screen so that you guys can see it. And I hope it's zoomed out just well enough for your benefit. Okay. So, <clears throat> chapter one. Absurd ideas of the disciples of Valentinus as to the origin, name, order in conjugal productions of their fancied aeons, of the passages of scripture which they adapt to their opinions. They maintain that, that, in, the visible, that in the invisible ineffable heights above there exists a certain perfect pre-existent aeon, whom they call Proarche, Propator, and Bifus, and describe as being invisible and incomprehensible. Eternal and unbegotten, he remained throughout innumerable cycles of ages in profound serenity and kisses. There existed along with him Anoia, whom they also called Caris and Sige. At last, this Bythus determined to send forth from himself the beginning of all things and deposited this production, which he had resolved to bring forth in his contemporary Saige, even as seed is deposited in the womb. She then, having received the seed and becoming pregnant, gave birth to Noah's, who was both similar and equal to him who had produced him, and was alone capable of comprehending his father's greatness. This Noah's they called also monogamous and father, and the beginning of all things. Along with him was also produced Alethea, and these four constituted the first and first begotten Pythagorean tetrad, which they also denominate the root of all things. For there are first Bythus and Saige, and then Noos and Alethea, and Monogenes, perceiving for what purpose he had been produced, also himself sent forth Logos and Zo being the father of all those who were to come after him, and the beginning and fashioning of the entire Pleroma. By conjunction of Logos and Zo were brought forth Anthropus and Ecclesia, and thus was formed the first begun Adoed, the root and substance of all things, called among them by four names, Bythus and Noos and Logos and Anthropos, for each of these is masculine feminine, as follows, Propator was united by a conjunction with the Enoia, then Monogenes, then is, that is Noos, with Althea, Logos with Zo, and Anthropos with Ecclesia. These aeons having been produced for the glory of the Father and wishing by their own efforts to effect this object, 
send forth emanations by a means of conjunction. Lagas and Zo, after producing Anthropos and Ecclesia, send forth other ten aeons, whose names are the following. Theus and Mixus, Agaratos and Henosis, Otophius and, H- and Hedon, Asinatos and Syncasis, Monogenes and Macaria. These are the ten aeons whom they declare to have been produced by Logos and Zo. They then add that Anthropos himself, along with Ecclesia, produced twelve aeons, to whom they give the following names. Paracletus and Pistis, Patricos and Elpis, Metricos and Agape, Ainos and Synesis, Ecclesiasticos and Makariotis, Delatos and Sophia. Such are the thirty aeons in the erroneous system of these men, and they are described as being wrapped up, so to speak, in silence, and known and known to none, except these professing teachers. Moreover, they declare that this invisible and spiritual pleroma of theirs is tripartite, being divided into an agdoad, a decad, and a duodecad. And for this reason they affirm it was that the Savior, for they do not please to call him Lord, did no work in public during the space of thirty years, thus setting forth the mystery of these aeons. They maintain also that these thirty aeons are most plainly indicated in the parable of the laborers sent into the vineyard. For some are sent about the first hour, others about the third hour, others about the sixth hour, others about the ninth hour, and others about the eleventh hour. Now, if we add up the numbers of the hours here mentioned, the sum total will be 30, 4, 1, 3, 6, 9, and 11, when added together, form 30. And with the hours, they hold that the aeons were pointed out, while they maintain that these are great and wonderful and hitherto unspeakable, unspeakable mysteries, which it is their special function to develop. And so they proceed when they find anything in the multitude of things contained in the scriptures which they can adopt and accommodate to their basis speculations. Chapter 2 The Propator was known to Monogenes alone. Ambition, disturbance, and danger into which Sophia fell. Her shapeless offspring, she is restored by Horus, the production of Christ and of the Holy Spirit in order to the completion of the aeons, a manner of the production of Jesus. They proceed to tell us that the propriety of their scheme was known only to Monogenes, who sprang from him. In other words, only to Noah, while to all the others he was invisible and incomprehensible. And, according to them, Noah alone took pleasure in contemplating the Father and exalting in consideration his immeasurable greatness. While he, also, while he also meditated how he might communicate to the rest of the aeons the greatness of the Father, revealing to them how vast and mighty he was, and how he was without beginning, beyond comprehension, and altogether incapable of being seen. But, in accordance with the will of the Father, Saiga restrained him, because it was his design to lead them all to an acquaintance with the aforesaid propator, and to create within them a desire of investigating his nature. In like manner, the rest of the aeons also, in a kind of quiet way, had a wish to behold the author of their being, and to contemplate that first cause which had no beginning. But there rushed forth in advance of the rest that Aeon, who was much the latest of them, and was the youngest of the duodecad which sprang from Anthropos and Ecclesia, namely Sophia, and suffered passion apart from the embrace of her consort Thelatus. This passion, indeed, first arose among those who were connected with Noah and Eletheia, but passed as by contagion this degenerate Aeon who acted under a pretense of love, 
but was in reality influenced by temerity because she had not, like Millis, enjoyed the communi- enjoyed communion with the perfect father. The, this passion, they say, consisted in a desire to search into the nature of the father, for she wished, according to them, to comprehend his greatness. When she could not attain her end, and as much as she aimed at an impossibility, and thus became involved in an extreme agony of mind, while both of account of the vast profundity as well as the unsearchable nature of the father, and on account of the love she bore him, she was ever stretching herself forward. There was a, there was danger lest she should at last have been absorbed by his sweetness and resolved into his absolute essence, unless she had met with, the, with that power which supports all things and preserves them outside of the unspeakable greatness. This power they term Horus, by whom, they say, she was restrained and supported, and that then, having with difficulty been brought back to herself, she was convinced that the father is incomprehensible and so laid aside her original design, along with that passion which had arisen with her from the overwhelming influence of her admiration. But others of them fabulously describe the passion and restoration of Sophia as follows. They say that she, having engaged in an impossible and and impracticable attempt, brought forth an an amorphous substance, such as her female nature enabled her to produce. When she locked upon it, her first feeling was one of grief on account of the imperfection of its generation, and then of fear lest this should end her own existence. Next she lost, as it were, all command of herself, and was in the greatest perplexity while endeavoring to discover the cause of all this, and what way she might conceal what had happened. Being greatly harassed by these passions, she at last changed her mind and endeavored to return anew to the father. When, however, she in some measure made the attempt Strength failed her, and she became a suppliant of the father. The other aeons, Noah's in particular, presented their supplications along with her, and hence they declared material substance had its beginning from ignorance and grief and fear and bewilderment. The father afterwards produces, in his own image, by means of monogenous, the above-mentioned Horus, without conjunction, masculo-feminine. For they maintain that sometimes the father acts in conjunction with Saige, but that at other times he shows himself independent both of, of male and female. They term this Horus both Starus and Lytrotis, and Carpistus and Horothetes, and Metagogus. And by this Horus they declare that Sophia was purified and established while she was also res- restored to her proper conjunction. For her enthymesis, or inborn idea, having been taken away from her, along with its supervening passion, she herself certainly remained within the Paroma. But her enthymesis, with its passion, was separated from her by Horus, fenced off and expelled from that circle. This enthymesis was, no doubt, a spiritual substance, possessing some of the natural tendency of an aeon, tendencies of an aeon, but at, the, but at the same time shapeless and without form, because it had received nothing. And on this account they say that it was an and on, and on this account they say that it was an imbecile and feminine production. After this substance had been placed outside of the pleroma of the aeons, and its mother restored to her proper conjunction, they tell us that monogenous acting in accordance with the prudent forethought of the Father, gave origin to another conjugal pair, namely Christ and the Holy Spirit. Oh my goodness. Lest any of the aeons should fall into a calamity similar to that of Sophia. For the purpose of fortifying and strengthening the Paroma, and who at the same time completed the number of the aeons, 
Christ then instructed them as to the nature of their conjunction and taught them that those who possessed the comprehension of the unbegotten were sufficient for themselves. He also announced among them that what related to the knowledge of the Father, namely that he cannot be understood or comprehended, nor so much as seen or heard, except in so far as he is known by monogenous only. And the reason why the rest of the aeons possess perpetual existence is found in the part of the Father's nature which is incomprehensible. But the reason of their origin and formation was situated in that which may be comprehended regarding him, that is, in the Son. Christ, then, who had just been produced, effected these things among them. But the Holy Spirit taught them to give thanks on being all rendered equal among themselves, and led them to a state of true repose. Thus, then, they tell us that the aeons were constituted equal to each other in form and sentiment, so that all became as Noos and Logos and Anthropos and Christus. The female aeons, too, became all as Aletheia and Zo and Spiritus and Ecclesia. Everything then being thus established and brought into a state of perfect rest, they next tell us that these beings sang praises with great joy to the Propator, who himself shared in the abounding exaltation. Then, out of gratitude for the great benefit which had been concerned on them, the whole plurum of the aeons, with one design and desire, and with the concurrence of Christ and the Holy Spirit, their father, also setting the seal of his approval on their conduct, brought together whatever each one had in himself of the greatest beauty and preciousness. And, uniting all these contributions so as skillfully to blend the whole, they produced, to the honor and glory of Bythus, a being of most perfect beauty, the very star of the Pleroma, and the perfect fruit of it, namely, Jesus. So they think by this is Jesus. Him they also speak of under the name of Savior in Christ, and patronomically log us in everything, because he was formed from the contributions of all. Then we are told that, by way of honor, angels of the same nature as himself were simultaneously produced to act as his bodyguard. Let's read another chapter. I feel, you know, I feel short. <laughs> let's, hope, let's open another chapter. Let's see if we can do it until six. I do enjoy reading this. It's just getting interesting, folks. this and let's open a new one chapter 3 texts of holy scripture used by these heretics to support their opinions such, then, is the account they give of what took place within the Pleroma, such the calamities that flowed from, their, from the passion which seized upon the Aeon who has been named, and who was within a little of perishing by being absorbed in the universal substance, through her inquisitive searching after the Father, such the consolidation of that Aeon, from her condition of agony by Horus and Starus and Latrotus, and Carpistus, and Herophatus, and Metagogus. Such also in the account of the generation of the latter aeons, namely of the first Christ, and of the Holy Spirit, but of whom were produced by the Father after the repentance of Sophia, and of the second Christ, whom they also styled Savior, who owed, him, uh, who, who, who owed his being to the joint contributions of the aeons, they tell us, however, that this knowledge has not been openly divulged because all are not capable of receiving it, but has been mystically revealed with the, sa the Savior 
through means of parables to those qualified for understanding it. This has been done as follows. The 30 aeons are indicated, as we have already remarked, for the 30 years during which they say the Savior performed no public act and by the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. Paul also, they affirm, very clearly and frequently names the aeons, and even goes so far as to preserve their order. But he says, to all the generations of the aeons of the aeon. Nay, we ourselves, when at the giving of things, we pronounce the words to aeons of aeons, forever and ever. Do set forth these aeons, and, in fine, wherever the words aeon or aeons occur, they at once refer them to these beings. The production, again, of the duodecad of the aeons is indicated by the fact that the Lord was twelve years of age when he disputed with the teachers of the law, and by the election of the apostles, for of these there were twelve. The other eighteen aeons are made manifest in this way, that the Lord, according to them, conversed with his disciples for eighteen months after his resurrection from the dead. They also affirm that these eighteen aeons are strikingly indicated by the first two letters of his name, uh, Jesus, namely, uh, Jesus, namely, Iota, and Eta, and in like manner, they assert that the ten aeons are pointed out with the letter Iota, which begins his name. While, for the same reason, they tell us the Savior said, One Iota, or one title, shall be by no means pass away until all be fulfilled. They further maintain that the passion which took place in the case of the twelfth aeon is pointed out by the apostasy of Judas who was the twelfth apostle, and also by the fact that Christ suffered in the twelfth month. For their opinion is that he continued to preach for one year only after his baptism. The same thing is also most clearly indicated by the case of the woman who suffered from an issue of blood. For after she had been thus afflicted during twelve years, she was healed by the advent of the Savior. When she had touched the border of his garment, and on this account the Savior said, who touched me, teaching his disciples the mystery which had occurred among the aeons, and the healing of that aeon who had been involved in suffering. For she who had been afflicted twelve years represented that power, whose essence, as they narrate, was stretching itself forth and the flowing up into immensity. And unless she had touched the garment of the sun, that is, Athea of the first tetrad, who is denoted by, the, by them, spoken no who is denoted by the hem spoken of she would have been dissolved into the general essence of which she participated she stopped short however and ceased any longer to suffer for the power that went forth from the sun and the power they termed Horus healed her and separated the passion from her they moreover affirm that the savior is shown to be derived from all the aeons, and to be in himself everything but the following passage. Every male that openeth the womb, for he, being everything, opened the womb of the enthemesis of the suffering aeon, when it had been expelled from the Pleroma. This they also style the second of Doad, of which we shall speak pre presently, and they state that it was clearly on this account that Paul said, and he himself is all things, and again, all things are to him, and of him are all things. And further, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead. And yet again, all things are gathered together by God in Christ. Thus do they interpret these and any like passages to be found in Scripture. They show further that the Horus of their theirs, that that Horus of theirs, which they, which, which, whom they call by a variety of names, has two faculties, the one of supporting and the other of separating. And in so far as he supports and sustains, he is Staurus, 
and so far as he divides and separates, he is Horus. They then represent the Savior as having indicated this twofold faculty. First, the sustaining power, when he said, Whosoever doth not bear his cross, Staurus, and follow after me, cannot be my disciple. And again, taking up the cross follows me. But the separating power, when he said, I came not to send peace, but a sword. They also maintain that John indicated the same thing when he said, The fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge the floor and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with her with fire inquenchable. By this declaration he set forth the faculty of Horus. For that fan they explained to be the cross Starus which consumes, no doubt, all material objects, as fire does chaff, but it purifies all them that are saved, as a fan does wheat. Moreover, they affirm that the Apostle Paul himself made mention of this cross in the following words, The doctrine of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to us who are saved, it is in the power of God. And again, God forbid that I should glory in anything save in the cross of Christ, by whom the world is crucified to me, and I unto the world. Such, then, is the account which they all give off their pleroma, and the formation of the universe, striving as they do to adapt the good works of revelation to their own wicked inventions. And it is not only from the writings of the evangelist and the apostles that they endeavor to derive proofs for their opinions by means of perverse interpretations and deceitful expositions, they deal in the same way with the law and the prophets, which contain many parables and allegories that can frequently be drawn into various senses according to the kind of exegesis to which they are subjected, and others of them with great craftiness adapted such parts of scripture to their own figments led away captive from the truth those who do not retain a steadfast faith in one God, the Father Almighty, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Chapter 4. Account given by the heretics of the formation of Akamath, origin of the visible world from her disturbances. The following are the transactions which they narrate as having occurred outside of the Paroma. The enthemesis of that Sophia who dwells above, which they also turn Akamath, being removed from the Paroma, together with their passion, they relate to have as a matter of course. Become violently, become violently excited in those places of darkness and vacuity, vacuity to which she had been banished. For she was excluded from light and the pleroma, and was without form or figure, like an untimely birth, because she had received nothing from a male parent. But the, fir, but the, but the Christ dwelling on high took pity upon her, and having extended himself through and beyond Staurus, he imparted a figure to her, but merely as respect and substance, and not so as to convey intelligence. Having effected this, he withdrew his influence and returned, leaving Akamath herself in order that she, becoming sensible of her suffering as being severed from the Paroma, might be influenced by the desire of better things while she possessed in the meantime a kind of odor of immortality left in her by Christ and the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Wherefore also she is called by two names, Sophia after her father, for Sophia is spoken of as being her father, and Holy Spirit from the Spirit who was along with Christ. Having then obtained a form along with intelligence and being immediately deserted by the Logos, 
who had been invisibly present with her, that is, by Christ, she strained herself to discover that light which had forsaken her, but could not affect her purpose, inasmuch as she was prevented by Horace. And as Horace thus obstructed her father, uh, and as Horace had thus obstructed her further progress, he exclaimed, Iao, whence, they say, this name Iao, derived its origin. And when she could not pass by Horus on account of that passion in which she had been involved, and because she alone had been left without, she then resigned herself to every sort of the manifold and varied state of passion to which she was subject. And thus she suffered grief on the one hand because she had not obtained the object of her desire and fear on the other hand, lest life itself should fail her as light had already, as light had already done. While, in addition, she was in the greatest perplexity, all these feelings were associated with ignorance, and this ignorance of hers was not like that of her mother, the first Sophia, an aeon, due to the degeneracy by means of passion, but to an innate opposition of nature to knowledge. Moreover, another kind of passion fell upon her, Akamoth, namely, that of desiring to return to him who gave her life. This collection of passions to declare was the substance of the matter from which this world was formed. For from her desire of returning to, to whom who gave her life, every soul belonging to this world, and that of the, and that of the demiurge, demiurge himself, derived its origin. All other things owed their beginning to her terror and sorrow. From, for from her tears all that is of a li sorry. Sorry about there. Anyway, for from her tears all that is of a liquid nature was formed, from her smile all that is lucent, and from her grief and perplexity all the corporeal elements of the world. For at one time, as they affirm, she would weep and lament on account of being left alone in the midst of darkness and vacuity, while at another time reflected on the light which had forsaken her. She would be filled with joy and laugh. Then again, she would be struck with terror, or at other times, would sink into consternation and bewilderment. No one follows from all this. No light tragedy comes out of it. As the fancy of every man among them pompously explains, one in one, one, in one way, and another in another, from what kind of passion and from what element being derived its origin. They have good reason, as seems to me, why they should not feel inclined to teach these things to all in public, but only to such as are able to pay a high price for an acquaintance with such profound mysteries. For these doctrines are not, all, are not at all similar to those of which our Lord said, freely ye have received, freely give. They are, on the contrary, abstruse and portentous and profound mysteries, to be got at only with great labor by such as are in love with falsehood. For who would not expend all that he possessed, if only he might learn in return, that from the tears of the enthymesis of the aeon involved in passion, seas and fountains and rivers, and every liquid substance derives its origin, that light burst forth from her smile, and that from her perplexity and consternation the corporeal elements of the world had their formation. I feel somewhat inclined myself to contribute a few hints towards the development of their system. For when I perceive that the waters are, are in part fresh, such as fountains, rivers, showers, and so on, and in part soul. Such as those in the sea, I reflect with myself that all such waters cannot be derived from her tears, inasmuch as these are of a sal saline quality only. It is clear, therefore, that the waters which are salt are alone those which are derived from her tears. But it is probable that she, in her intense agony and perplexity, was covered with her with 
perspiration. And hence, following up their notion, we may conceive that fountains and rivers and all the fresh water in the world are due to this source. For it is difficult, since we know that all tears are of the same quality, to believe that water, both salt and fresh, proceeded from them. The more plausible supposition is that some are from her tears and some are no, rather, the more plausible supposition is that some are from her tears and some from her perspiration. And since there are also in the world certain waters which are not which are hot and acrid in their nature, though it must be left to guess their origin, how and whence? Such are the sum of the results of their hypothesis. They go on to state, when the mother Akamov had passed through all sorts of passion and had with difficulty escaped from them, she turned herself to supplicate the life which had forsaken her, that is, Christ. He, however, having returned to the Parama and being probably unwilling again to descend from it, sent forth to her the Paraclete, that is, the Savior. This being endowed, uh, this being was endowed with all power by Father, by the Father, who placed everything under his authority, the aeons, doing so likewise, so that by him were all things, visible and invisible, created thrones, divinities, dominions. He then was sent to her along with his contemporary angels, and they related that Akamoth, filled with reverence, had first veiled herself through modesty, but that by and by, when she had looked upon him with all his endowments and had acquired strength from his appearance, she ran forward to meet him. He then imparted to her form as respected intelligence and brought healing to her passions, separating them from her, but not so as to drive them out of, out of thought altogether. For it was not possible that they should be annihilated as in the former case, because they had already taken root and acquired strength so as to possess an indestructible existence. All that he had, all that he could do was to separate them and set them apart, and then commingle and condense them so as to transmute them from incorp incorporeal, incorporeal passion into unorganized matter. He then by this process confirmed upon a fit upon them a fitness and a nature to become concretions in corporeal structures, in order that two substances should be formed, the one evil resorting from the passions, and the other subject indeed to suffering, but originated from conversion. And on this account, an account of this hypostatizing of ideal matter. They say that the Savior virtually created the world. But when Akamoth was freed from her passion, she gazed with rapture on the dazzling vision of the angels that were with him. In her ecstasy, conceiving by them, they tell us that she brought forth new beings, partly after her own image, and partly a spiritual progeny after the image of the Savior's attendants. Chapter 5. Chapter 5. Formation of the Demiurge. How do you pronounce that? F Formation of the Demiurge. Demiurge. Description of him. He is the creator of everything I, of everything outside of the Pleroma. These three kinds of existence, then, having according to them, been now formed, one, for, one from the Passion, which was, a, which was matter, a second from the conversion, which was animal, and a third that which she, Akamoth herself, brought forth, which was spiritual. She next addressed herself to the task of giving these four. But she could not succeed in doing this as respected the spiritual existence, because it was of the same nature with herself, 
She therefore applied herself to give form to the animal substance which had proceeded from her own conversion, and to bring forth to life the instructions of the Savior. And they say she first formed out of an animal substance, him who is father and king of all things, both of these which are of the same nature with himself, that is, animal substance, which they also called right-handed, and those which sprang from the passion and from matter, which they call left-handed. For they affirm that he formed all the things which came into existence after him, being secretly impelled thereto by his mother. From this circumstance they style him Metropator, Apator, Demiurge, and Father, saying that he is father of the substances in the right hand, that is, of the animal, of Demiurge, of those, of those on the left, that is, of the material, while he is at the same time the king of all. For they say that this Enthemesis, desirous of making all things to the honor of the Aeons, formed images of them, or rather that the Savior did so through her instrumentality. And she, in the image of the Invisible Father, kept herself concealed from the Demiurge. But he was in the image of the only begotten Son, and the angels and archangels created by him were in the image of the rest of the Aeons. They affirm, therefore, that he was constituted the Father and God of everything outside of the Paroma, being the creator of all animal and material substances. For, it, for he it was that the discriminate of these two kinds of existence hitherto confused and made corporeal from incorporeal substances, fashioned things heavenly and earthly, and became the frame of demiurge of these of things material and animal, of those on the right and those on the left, of the light and of the heavy, and of those tending upwards as well as of those tending downwards. He created also seven heavens, above which they say that he, the demiurge, exists. And on this account they term him Hebdomas, and his mother Akamath, of Doads, persevering the number preserving the number of the first begotten and primary of Doad as the Plurama. They affirm, moreover, that these seven heavens are intelligent and speak of them as being angels, which they refer to the Demiurge himself as being an angel bearing a likeness of God. And in the same strain, they declare that paradise, situated above the third heaven, is a fourth angel possessed of power, from whom Adam derived certain qualities while he conversed with him. They go on to say that the Demiurge imagined that he created all these things of himself, while he in reality made them in conjunction with the production power of Akamoth. He formed the heavens, yet was ignorant of the heavens. He fashioned men, man, yet knew not man. He brought to light the earth, yet had no acquaintance with the earth, and, in like manner, they declare that he was ignorant of the forms of all that he made, and knew not even of the existence of his own mother, but imagined that he himself was all things. They further affirm that this mother originated this opinion in his mind, because she desired to bring him forth possessed of such a character that, she, that he should be the head and source of his own essence and the absolute ruler over every kind of operation that was afterwards attempted. This mother they also called Agdoed, Sophia, Terra, Jerusalem, Holy Spirit, and with the masculine reference, Lord. Her place of habitation is an intermediate one, above the Demiurge, indeed, but below and outside of the Paroma even to the end. As, then, they represent all material substance to be formed from three passions, fear, grief, and perplexity, the account they give is as follows. Animal substances originated from fear and from conversion. The demiurge they also describe as owing his origin to conversion but the existence of all other animal substances they ascribe to fear, 
such as the souls of irrational animals and of wild beasts and men. And on this account, he, the Demiurge, being incapable of recognizing any spiritual essences, imagined himself to be God alone, and declared through the prophets, I am God, and besides me there is no one else, there is none else. They further teach that the spirits of wickedness derive their origin from grief. Hence, the devil, whom they also call Cosmocrator, the ruler of the world, and the demons and the angels and every wicked spiritual being that exists, found the source of their existence. They represent Demiurge as being the son of that mother of theirs, Akama, and, Cos and, Cos and Cosmocrator as the creature of the Demiurge. Cosmic Crater has knowledge of what is about himself, because he is a spirit of wickedness. But the Demiurge is, is ignorant of such things. Inasmuch as he is merely animal, their mother dwells in that place which is above the heavens, that is, in the intermediate abode, the Demiurge in the heavenly place, that is, in the Hebdomad, but the Cosmic Crater in this our world. The corporeal elements of the world, again, sprang, as we before remarked, from bewilderment and perplexity as from a more ignoble source. Thus the earth arose from the state of stupor, water from the agitation caused by her fear, air from the consolidation of her grief, while fire producing death and corruption was inherent in all these elements, even as they teach the ignorance also they concealed in these three passions. Having thus formed the world, he, the Demiurge, also created the earth, the uh, earthy part of man, not taking him from this dry earth, but from an invisible substance consisting of fusible and fluid matter. And then afterwards, as they define the process, breathed into him the animal part of his nature. It was this latter which was created after his image and likeness, the material part, indeed, was very near to God, so as far as the image went, but not of the same substance with him. The animal, on the other hand, was so in respect to likeness, and hence his substance was called the spirit of life, because it took its rise from the spiritual outflowing. After all this, he was, they say, enveloped all around with a covering of skin, and by this they mean the outward sensitive flesh. But they further affirm that the Demiurge himself was ignorant of that offspring of his mother, Akamoth, which she brought forth as a consequence of her contemplation of those angels who waited on the Savior, and which was, like herself, of a spiritual nature. She took advantage of this ignorance and deposited her production in him without his knowledge, in order that, being by his instrumentality infused into the animal soul proceeding from himself, and being thus carried as in a womb in this material body, while it is gradually increased in strength, might in course of time become fitted for the reception of perfect rationality. Thus it came to pass then, according to them, that, without any knowledge on the part of the demiurge, the man formed by his inspiration was at the same time, through an unspeakable providence, rendered a spiritual man by the simultaneous inspiration received from Sophia. For, as he was ignorant of his mother, so neither did he recognize her offspring. This offspring they also declared to be the Ecclesia, an emblem of the Ecclesia which is above. This, then, is the kind of man who, whom they conceive of. He has his animal soul from the demiurge, his body from the earth, his fleshy part from matter, and his spiritual man from the mother, Akamah. Lee, chapter 6. Okay, chapter 6. Hold on. Chapter 6, 
the threefold kind of men feigned by these heretics. Good works needless for them, though necessary to others. Their abandoned morals. Hmm. There being thus three kinds of substances, they declare, of all that is material, which they also describe as being on the left hand, that it must of necessity perish, inasmuch as it is incapable of receiving any aphotis of incorruption. As to every animal existence, which they also denominate on the right hand, they hold that inasmuch as it is a mean between the spiritual and the material, it passes to the side to which inclination draws it. Spiritual substance, again, they describe as having been sent forth for this end. That, being here united with that which is animal, it might assume shape, the two elements being simultaneously subjected to the same discipline. And this they declare to be the salt and the light of the world. For the animal substance had need of trading by means of the outward senses, and on this account they affirm that the world was created, as well as that the Savior came to the animal substance which was possessed of free will, that he might secure for its salvation. For they affirm that he received the first fruits of those whom he was to save, as follows. From Akamoth, that which was spiritual, while he was invested by the demiurge with the animal Christ, but was begirt by a special dispensation with the body, endowed with him an animal nature, yet constructed with unspeakable skill, so that it might be visible and tangible and capable of enduring suffering. At the same time, they deny that he assumed anything material into his nature, since indeed matter is incapable of salvation. They further hold that the consummation of all things will take place when all that is spiritual has been formed and perfected by gnosis, knowledge, and by this they mean spiritual men who have attained to the perfect knowledge of God and been, and been initiated into these mysteries by Akamoth, and they represent themselves to be these persons. Animal men, again, are instructed in animal things. Such men, namely, as are established by their works and by a mere faith, while they, have not per while they have not perfect knowledge. We of the church, they say, are these persons. Wherefore also they maintain that good works are necessary to us, for, the other for that otherwise it is impossible we should be saved. But as to themselves, they hold that they shall be entirely and undoubtedly, undoubtedly saved not by means of conduct, but because they are spiritual by nature. For, just as, it is, just as it is impossible that material substance should partake of salvation, since indeed they maintain that it is incapable of receiving it, so again it is impossible that spiritual substance, by which they mean themselves, should ever come under the power of corruption, whatever the sort of actions in which they indulge. For even as gold, when submerged in filth, loses not on the account its beauty, but retains its own native qualities. The filth, having no power to injure the gold, so they affirm that they cannot in any measure suffer her, or lose their spiritual substance, whatever the material actions in which they may be involved. Wherefore also it comes to pass that the most perfect among them addict themselves without fear to all those kinds of forbidden deeds of which the scripture assure us that they who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. For instance, they make no scruple about eating meats offered in sacrifice to idols, imagining that they can in this way contract no defilement. Then again, had every heathen festival celebrated in honor of the idols, these men are the first to assemble, and to such a pitch do they go, that some of them do not keep away from the bloody spectacle hateful both to God and men, in which gladiators either fight with wild beasts or singly encounter one another. Others of them yield themselves unto the lusts of the flesh with the utmost greediness, maintaining that carnal things should be allowed to the carnal nature, 
or spiritual things are provided for the spiritual. Some of them, moreover, are in the habit of defiling these women to whom they have taught the above doctrine, as has frequently been confessed by those women who had been led astray by certain of them on their returning to the Church of God, and acknowledging this along with the rest of their errors. Others of them, too, openly and without a blush, having become passionately attached to certain women, seduce them away from their husbands, and contract marriages of their own with them. Others of them, again, who pretend at first to live in all modesty with them as with sisters, have in course of time been revealed in their true colors when the sister has been found with child by her pretended brother. And committing many other abominations and impieties, they run us down, who from the fear of God guards against sinning even thought or word, even in thought or word, as utterly contemptible and ignorant persons, while they highly exalt themselves and claim to be perfect and the elect seed. For they declare that we simply receive grace for use. Wherefore also it will be again be taken away from us. But they had themselves have grace as their own special possession, which has descended from above by means of an unspeakable and indescribable conjunction. And on this account more will be given them. They maintain, therefore, that in every way it was always necessary for them to practice the mystery of conjunction, and that they may persuade the thoughtless to believe this. They are in the habit of using these very words. Whosoever being in this world does not love, no, whosoever being in this world does not so love a woman as to obtain possession of her is not of the truth, nor shall attain to the truth, but whoever, but whosoever bring off this world has intercourse with women shall not attain to the truth, because he has so acted under the power of concupiscence. On this account, they tell us that it is necessary for us, whom they call animal men, and describe as being of the world, to practice continence and good works, that by this means we may attain at length to the intermediate habitation, but that to them who are called spiritual and perfect, such a course of conduct is not at all necessary. For it is not conduct of any kind which leads into the parama, but the seed sent forth thence in the feeble, immature state, and are brought to perfection. You know what this sounds like, ladies and gentlemen? Number two and number three sound a lot like Freemasons, because look at this. And the moment again are instructed in animal things. They only are established by their works and by mere faith, but they have not perfect knowledge. The church say are these persons. Best in themselves, they hold that they shall be entirely and undoubtedly saved, not by means of conduct, but because they are spiritual by nature. For just it is impossible that material substance. Oh, yeah. So they use this argument like, oh, that's not really your spirit. Your spirit is perfect. If you're committing impious acts or debauchery, that's just your carnal, okay? That's not your spiritual side. That is your carnal side. And again, we have a verse that counters that called, out of the abundance of the heart or mind or spirit, the mouth speak, which is the fleshly part of it. It is basically the speaker of the soul by means of, by means of, well, by means of predication to it, the mouth. Whatever is in your spirit, you act upon it. That is your character. That is how you behave. That is the entire idea. Even God would go as far as to say, man, look at, at the outward appearance. But God, look at the heart. God looks inward. If this is what you have in your spirit... How much more when you when you act how much more when you behave but then again because they also know that they would say something like oh that's just your fleshly nature that's not your spirit you're saved you're perfect in christ it's just your spirit now if you're doing bad things impious acts or going about debaucherous that's your that's your that's your fleshly nature well again wrong out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh 
God looks at the in. God looks at the heart. Okay, and then here we have also them falling into the category of the heart is desperate, the heart is wicked, and is deceitful and desperately wicked. Number three over here, wherefore also it come to pass that the most perfect among them addict themselves without fear to all those kinds of forbidden deeds of which the scripture assures us that they do such things that shall not inherit the kingdom of God. They do these things that scripture abhors, but because they leverage that argument that in spirit they're perfect, it's like they have a it's like they have this go license to do this. But speaking of which, the Corinthians were I think they were ahead of this. Because when it came to sex, I mean I mean they were like, you know, still hanging around the temples, worshiping idols, and there were prostitutes. And when Paul confronted them and it was up to them to answer, they said, Well, I mean, well, this is fine, you know. I mean we're perfect in Christ, we're freed. But then again, Paul says, no, that's a very backwards way of thinking. Because remember, Jesus died for your sins. He didn't die for your sins so you could continue sinning. And then there's also Romans 6, verses 1 to 2. Shall we continue in sin that grace me abound? God forbid. How can we, how can we continue in it if we are dead to it? Right? It is a statement of metanoia, by the way. That's no, that is no sinless perfectionist or antinomian conclusion. And there they go. For instance, they make no scruple about eating meat. Man, the Valentinians may as well be as like a different breed of Corinthians. Because they had the same problem too. Eating meats, worship are given to idols. Now, here's the here's the qualifying statement with this one. Paul then Paul says, "What can an idol do? Right? It does nothing. So even if you so even if they they think they they're sacrificing these foods to an idols, it does nothing. So that food is not tainted. You can eat it. But then again." You have to be careful that you don't that you don't have people stumble. For example, like, or let's say they didn't even know this qualifying statement of Paul, right? Like they were ignorant of it. You had some meat, and then you would know that applies to you when it says, "Oh, look, he's Christian, but he's also worshiping idols by eating." So I guess idolatry is it's not really wrong. And that would create problems for you too, because throughout the Old Testament, idolatry is abhorred by the Lord. Now, qualifying statement, idols do nothing. They can't do anything, so you can eat it. But then again, you have those people, even if, especially if they're ignorant with Paul's qualifying statement concerning idols, if they're like hard pagans, well, they will look at you differently. So let's be careful with that. And yeah, all kinds of debauchery, more fleshly lusts, but they don't seem to, they don't, doesn't seem to bother them because they are what? Most perfect. They have, they are what? Spiritual by nature. After what? Coming to Christ? That's just your spiritual nature. Your spiritual nature is perfect. You doing all these bad stuff, that's the fleshly nature. Again, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaking. Now, the fourth paragraph connotates more towards sinless perfectionism because I'm just going to read the whole thing. And committing many other abominations and impieties, they run us down who from the fear of God guard against sinning even in thought or word as utterly contemptible and 
ignorant persons while they highly exalt themselves and claim to be perfect and the elect seed. See, this more connotates to sinless perfectionism. And according to St. Irenaeus, this is a heresy. So a certain someone and a certain group has a rehashed version, has their own rehashed version of some Valentinian heresy. And for they declare that we simply receive grace for use. So again, violating Romans 6.12, wherefore also it will be taken away from us, but that they themselves have grace as their own special possession, which has descended from above means of an unspeakable and indescribable conjunction. They maintain, therefore, that in every way it is also necessary for them to practice the mystery of conjunction, and that they may persuade that the thoughtless to believe this. You know what that means? They're getting even, let's say, the baby Christians to believe their bull crap. On this account, they tell us that it's necessary for us whom they call animal men and describe us being of the world, to practice continence in good works, that by this means we may attend at length to the intermediate habitation, but that to them who are called the spiritual and perfect, such a course of conduct is not at all necessary. Same old argument. You need, to, you need to practice good works. You need to practice continence. You need to practice discipline. Those are things of the Holy Spirit. You have to mortify your old man. But, well, why do we need to do that? I thought we were perfect in spirit. Yeah, you need to do that to control your animal, animal side. Okay. Like... I can't completely word this, but in a way, this whole oh, it's not your oh, it's not your spirit; it's your carnal nature that's making you do all bad things. This is like a this is like begging the question to me, okay? And or let's say this is redundant. How can you say that? How can you say that? You don't have to worry about it because it's our fleshly nature that sins, not our spirit. But then you maintain that we have to do good works. Even James 2 speaks on this one. Well, anyway, I've, I've, anyway then, I have kept the end of my bargain. I mean, I only want, I, I, well, I wouldn't be on I wanted only this to be like chapters 1 and 2, but it got interesting. So I'm going to change the title into chapters 1 to 6 reading <laughs> instead. So uh, yeah, I know viewers right now, but I hope you guys catch this in the vibe. And if you do enjoy this, do leave a like and share it with your friends and those who uh, and I hope and those who may be interested with this book, and I hope this is also a blessing. God bless you all, and I thank the Lord for another, for another for another day, and for even being gracious enough that I can even do this to point out this heresy of even by the sixth chapter of free grace and sinless perfectionism. We know that these are these are like heresies that pervert Scripture. And it is very clear that even it is very clear that we are indeed in need of discernment, as Proverbs would always put it. So we have to be careful with these heresies, folks. So I am about to go ahead bed. I don't have any words now other than don't take your salvation for granted and take your soul. Uh, sanctification. Seriously, my name is St. Ronan, and I'm signing out in three, two, one.